Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your leadership, uh, David. And uh, this, this forum, to a great extent, uh, has made the progress that it's made and has been inspired by, by your leadership. And another of our great leaders uh, in, uh, in the, on the board uh, of, the, uh, of Chile uh, is Orlando Padilla. And I want to thank him for bringing, for inviting uh, and, and making possible um, our, um, the presence of our next speaker. And Orlando asked me to introduce him, and it's an honor for me to be able to introduce Governor Engler. I remember when I was here in the 90s in Congress, and, you know, there was a lot of success. It wasn't easy um, uh, during those years. Um, and, you know, nothing more impressive than actually balancing the budget. But the model that we would look to uh, was Michigan that had a dynamic economy and job growth. But to a great extent, it was because of their governor. Uh, and we would look at John Engler as the success model. And what he was able to do what he was able to do as governor of Michigan was extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, multiple times he cut taxes uh, for the people of Michigan, created an environment through his leadership where eight, more than 800,000 new jobs were created in Michigan. So we would look at that model of success with really in, in, in awe of, uh, of what, it, what it meant. And he's a, he is an extraordinary leader. Today, he chairs, uh, he's the president of the Business Roundtable, the association of CEOs of the largest corporations in the United States, the corporations that produce almost eight trillion dollars in annual revenues and employ more than 16 million people. Again, I thank Orlando Padilla for bringing him to us. Chile wants to partner with John Engler, and it's an honor for me to be able to welcome today, this morning, uh, Governor John Engler. Thank you very much, Congressman. That, that, uh, what a delightful introduction. I just want to keep that on tape, take it home, <laughs> show it to my daughters, uh, my wife. Uh, um, I'm thrilled to be here today to be able to join the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute uh, for the symposium on trade and global economy. I'm, I'm delighted to have this chance to uh, interact with so many leaders from across the country and impressed that uh, so many members of the congressional delegation have already been here and had a chance to you know, come to the podium and to talk about some of the issues. I thought that I told very quickly as Congressman Cabello was leaving, I said, you know, his comments on STEM and STEM jobs and the way education needs to change and the way it can improve in this country and help young people prepare is spot on. I'm uh, at noon today speaking at uh, an organization called Jobs for America's Graduates, JAG, and it's a program that uh, actually several uh, governors are currently serving on the board of, uh, and um, members of Congress in both parties have been kind enough to support, but uh, it's at the state and local level where this happens, but uh, they really have done a wonderful job of helping young people get exposed, uh, and many of these are young people who are somewhat at risk of maybe not completing school or certainly not being exposed to the potential that the Congressman talked about in terms of STEM and STEM jobs in the economy. So. They've done a wonderful job. It's a program that's in a lot of states. It's, it's spreading. And uh, the thing I like about it, it's been around for you know, a quarter century, but it's been growing. And it, it really does help people understand the real economy. And Washington is very much a bubble here. I mean, we have a lot of bubbles that ha happen from time to time. We're kind of a permanent bubble here. Uh, but uh, what the congressman was talking about and the opportunities that he pointed out are absolutely real and they're spectacular and uh, the demand going forward is, is never ending and just you know a sidebar back here while I was in the room 
I was being informed about a great conference that's coming up next spring. It's a kind of a global focus. Some of our members at the round table are participating in this. Uh, again, a STEM conference. I mean, in STEM, we're talking about science and technology, engineering, mathematics. We're talking about the kind of skills that in today's 21st century economy are being incorporated into most every job. And we, we don't even think about blue collar jobs so much anymore. They're kind of giving way to what we would call blue tech jobs. And, and that's a neat way to think about it because a blue tech job sounds a, a bit more appealing and it, it sounds like something I might want part of. And when you look at the economics surrounding those jobs, you know it's something that you might want part of. And so getting the word out, uh, uh, there's been a little bit of debate in the country and I, I want to talk about trade, but I, I thought I just had to put this aside in that, uh, you know, we've seen people say, well, everybody needs to go to college. Well, I'm not sure that's the right way to say it. Everybody needs to have skills, that's for sure. Now those skills, you can get those by going to a college, but that college might be not a four year, but maybe it's a two year. Maybe it's a specialized training program. And one of the goals that we have is to see all of this education and training sort of linked up, joined up, if you will, so that you continue to sort of stack on credentials as you go through life. And uh, that is important, whether you're gonna in a traditional manufacturing plant, Orlando had a tremendous career with General Motors and they had a, a whole, whole lot of careers and opportunities for people. But uh, today, all of these different classifications used to there kind of been all wiped away and now people get skills and they get opportunities based on the skills they have. And uh, that's the way it's gonna be across the economy. So I, I really am I'm thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to uh, Lincoln to have this opportunity. Thank you so much for your, your generous introduction to um, you know, the two co-chairs, uh, uh, our members of the delegation, Quaylard and P.S. Ballard, and all of the colleagues who came here today uh, who've been part of the organization, the Institute, and who supported Trade Promotion Authority, giving the president the authority they helped to get that passed in Congress, helped to get it signed into law, and our belief at the roundtable with these companies that are globally engaged, and we've just heard from two outstanding representatives, two of our member companies, GE and J.P. Morgan Chase. I mean, presidents, regardless of party uh, and their negotiators, need to have the ability to go out and negotiate the best deal possible for the United States of America. That's we think of that as high standards trade agreements and. What they end up doing is strengthening the U.S. economy and they sure help put Americans to work. We think that trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership are exactly the kind of uh, trade negotiations we ought to be focused on as a nation. We ought to be uh, pushing hard to make sure they're successful. When we did TPA, and this was kind of mentioned, uh, bo both the congressmen had uh, that they had kind of some references to this. You'll hear this anytime you're in Washington uh, about how people work or don't work together. But the TPA uh, passage, actually that debate and that process represented the kind of bipartisan cooperation that we need a lot more of in Washington. And frankly, we need it all over the country, but uh, we need it, why? Because if we're gonna successfully tackle the challenges that the United States faces and we're gonna seize opportunities, we kind of have to work together and the CEOs at the round table the, the Jeff Immels, the Jamie Dimons, and the, the 200 others that are there, they're all about seizing opportunities. I mean, let's make no mistake about it, they lead companies, and you've heard a little bit about a couple of these, but they're in every sector of the economy. Uh, most of them are quite engaged globally, and while they've got these diverse uh, business uh, profiles, the one thing that absolutely unites them, no matter where they come from in the country or what sector of the economy they're most active in is they strongly support and advocate for policies that support stronger economic growth and jobs here in the U.S. We're about jobs in the U.S. and growth here. Great Recession, you know, that ended back in 2009. Um, since then, though, we've experienced the slowest economic recovery in 50 years. So we're, you know, we're better, but it's come slow. If the recovery had been more robust, uh, more like maybe we'd seen in the 80s, GDP today would be at least $1.6 trillion higher. That's a lot of opportunity that we have foregone. What'd that mean for families? Because that's really what, when it comes down to home, what's it mean? 
annual income's higher by as much as twenty thousand dollars. Pretty big, pretty big numbers. And so, there's no doubt in my mind we're going to have a debate about growth, the economy and its performance. That's going to last, probably will never end, but it sure is going to be intense through say a year from November. Uh, it's, it's just. Uh, no matter what the point of view that one would hold, I think there's one thing that's clear, though, and this is part of my message today, and it's part of the challenge I think that we, we should um, present to our elected officials, frankly, at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. It's not Beijing that forces the United States to have the highest corporate tax rate in the developed world with an outmoded system for taxing international earnings. It isn't Brussels that prevents us from fixing our immigration system. Nobody outside the country is stopping us from dealing with a broken immigration system. It certainly isn't our competitors that are closing down our export and finance uh, agency that Ambassador Nelson referenced. Uh, I'm sure they're delighted the authority for the Exim Bank has expired and the financing tool is no longer available, but it needs to be reinstated immediately. We believe if you want more growth and you want more jobs, you have to act, and these are the kinds of things that are very much front and center on the agenda. We also have to act to improve K-12 education. That's a, an imperative. Uh, we need young people to stay in school. We need graduates who are ready to go into the workforce or go on to college and get that kind of training that we talked about without having to take remedial courses. We need to act to fix the broken immigration system. We need to act to invest in infrastructure. We certainly need to act to take a smarter, more effective approach to regulation, and we need to act to take full advantage of this amazing energy opportunity that our nation has today. And I would say, given the conversation in this town, it's especially important this week, we need to act to avoid government, uh, to bud avoid budget uh, showdowns or government shutdowns. So. Uh, those are all actions we can take. When it comes to acting on trade agreements, then we, we got a few other countries to get involved then. That isn't quite so easy. We can't act unilaterally, but in Atlanta today and tomorrow, our ambassador, U.S. Uh, trade representative Michael Froman, he's going to be sitting down with counterparts from other countries who are involved with the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and they're going to be hopefully hammering out the final details, maybe by Thursday night, sometime Friday. They're going to be handshakes and smiles and... Uh, an agreement announced. And that just starts another process now that under the new legislation, it'll be 90 days before it could even be signed. It'll be studied and dissected. And I hope found, we believe, uh, signs are uh, very, very positive. Today, well, actually tomorrow, meanwhile, in Washington, the BRT led uh, Trade Benefits America Coalition, which was so important help win passage of uh, TPA. 500 associations, organizations, companies were deeply involved. We're going to reconvene. As somebody said, we're getting the band back together. And we're going to be looking at what comes next on the trade agenda. And uh, it's consistent with our belief that trade matters, that we have to be globally engaged. We also believe it has to be a two-way street. Again, the ambassador made that point. I mean, about the the benefits uh, don't and can't logically flow, flow only one direction, but a two-way street, two-way benefits. NAFTA, I was the governor in Michigan when we were doing ratification of NAFTA under uh, President Clinton's administration. Pretty much all the negotiation had been completed under uh, President George H.W. Bush, but then uh, the Congress had to pass NAFTA during the presidency of Bill Clinton. We got that done. Uh, governors your governor from Michigan, sitting on the Canadian border, we didn't think there was a border actually between uh, Michigan and Ontario. We thought there was a bridge there, but uh, that, that was Ontario. Windsor's where you went for lunch, you know. And before 9-11, it was about as open as it possibly could be. It had all changed a little bit, but uh, it's still, and that one bridge uh, is still the busiest crossing point on the northern border, but we, we felt and, and the forerunner of all of these trade agreements actually was the U.S.-Canada Auto Pact, if we go, we go back in time a little bit. So, so we've been, and uh, the current governor has said that he wants to be the most pro-trade and pro-immigration governor in America, and Governor Snyder's uh, been true to that word. But anyway, we, we think there's a lot to do. 
One thing that's in front of Congress now, it's important. We think the United States ought to lift the ban on oil exports. Um, we communicated that to Chairman Upton, his Energy and Commerce Committee's hard at work on that in the House of Representatives. But it's pretty hard to argue that other countries ought to open their markets, remove trade barriers, and then here we are pretty much banning the export of crude oil. And the, again, the data is pretty clear. That's a job boost and frankly a gasoline pump price lowering action if they take it. So uh, we, got, uh, we got lots of reasons why that ought to get done. But the potential of what we're talking about and where the opportunities lie, they're enormous. Look at TPP. Combined population of these dozen countries or so that are part of this, 486 million, about 16% of global trade impacted by these countries. Um, included in those 11 other countries, Chile, Mexico, Peru, they're critical markets and they've been leaders. Uh, but when we look at markets for goods and services, pretty important and pretty important examples for countries in the region, in the hemisphere. We think every state, though, and one of the things we're proud of, you go on our website, the Business Roundtable, brt.org, we've done a lot of work to show that there's benefits for virtually every state. We can see the case, and you can look at your own state, any region of the country, and see what those benefits are, but commercial engagement uh, globally matters today. And that impacts a lot of constituents. We think generates a lot of wealth. Uh, negotiators have got some pretty impressive goals. Uh, Congress gives them a lot of advice, too, about what they ought to be seeking to accomplish. But meaningful market access for goods and services that are produced here. Protection of intellectual property, pretty important. Uh, hard to have an innovation economy if you can't keep it but five minutes after it's created because somebody's engaged in an act of cyber theft. You saw the hopeful announcement uh, that China and the U.S. may starting, be starting to get a little more serious about trying to protect that intellectual property. Investment protections, uh, something that J.P. Morgan would be very interested in for state, investor state dispute resolution. Very, very important. Government procurement, big vast markets that could be opened up and benefit. So the other thing about TPP, it's expected to establish disciplines in some newer areas where we haven't maybe been, you know, the, the economies change, they get a little more complicated and sophisticated, but fair competition with state-owned enterprises. We don't exactly have those in the U.S., but we sure have to compete against them. It's one of the reasons the Export-Import Bank is so uh, vital, we believe, as a tool. Protection of cross-border data flows. Um, that's, that's very important. We can't imagine everybody's going to have to build a data center in every part of the world where they might happen to do a little bit of business, but uh, if, if some of these uh, other countries would have their way, there'd be a lot of restrictions and uh, a lot of risk. And I think promotion of regulatory cooperation is awfully important. That's probably as important as anything in the, uh, the transatlantic, uh, the TTIP, the one with the European Union. Uh, there we don't have really the tariff barriers but we've got a lot of non-tariff barriers that are out there, and some of those are achieved by, by regulatory uh, fiat almost. These uh, provisions that protect IP, data flows, um, critical investments, global. Data today is global. Information moves pretty freely, pretty quickly. You can create IP anywhere, Palo Alto or Peru or Patagonia, but our goal, if we get this right, we ought to have the largest and create ever larger free trade areas, including the Asia Pacific countries. That, that would be a region there, more than half the global output, more than 40% of world trade. Look at our own hemisphere, adding South and Central American nations, very promising partners in expanding trade and investment. Again, stronger rules. And you do that and you get countries experiencing the kind of growth that we've seen in Peru and Colombia. Those numbers are pretty, pretty important. Um, you get a lot of, you know, I, you, you saw the ads and you hear the, some of the background noise in the debate, but there will be critics say, well, the benefits of trade, they're purely theoretical. So, you know, we, we don't know if there's really been, but boy, the harm we can feel that we see it. Well, I think the benefits are pretty proven. Um, since the U.S.-Peru FTA went into effect in 2008, not very long ago, the export of U.S. goods there climbed 60, our goods to them climbed 63%. 
U.S. exports to Colombia have jumped 42 percent since um, the U.S. Colombia FDA went into force in May of 2012. Short time, big jump. Those are those are tangible. Those are real. Those aren't uh, made up numbers. That's 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 the data. So I think it's pretty clear: removing trade barriers, expanding two-way trade, accelerating foreign direct investment in the U.S. And we're a, you know, in a in a in a world where the a lot of market uncertainty, especially in this volatile period that we're in today. The U.S. is a tremendous investment opportunity, and that some of that's going to be foreign. Now, I don't want that to happen just because the tax laws are out of balance, and that's one of the reasons we're strongly advocating uh, getting our tax structure, which hasn't really been changed since 1986, uh, improved and made more competitive. But we get this right. Man, all opportunities uh, for all Americans, and certainly Hispanic Americans, are going to benefit. Look at some of these numbers related to trade. I thought relevant again to our conversation here today. Trade related, 2.4 million jobs in Florida. Texas, over 3 million jobs. California, given its sheer size, 4.7 million. Um, those, are, those are big numbers. Even states like Ohio, a company like Procter & Gamble, something like 40% of their employment in Ohio, you wouldn't necessarily think Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, Mecca for trade, but about 40% of their jobs are directly related to the international activities of the company. And, and w the other data that I didn't bring this with me today, but we've looked at the data, the, the jobs that are related to international trade pay more. So that's also a good thing. The other thing that's true is, in, and this was mentioned, um, but many of these jobs are in small, medium-sized companies. And, and those are companies where there's been an initiative on the part of the Obama administration, the Commerce Department, Secretary Pritzker, um, you know, try to get many more of these companies involved in trading. Many of them only export to one or two countries, and you can guess if they only are doing one or two countries, they might be going south to Mexico or north to Canada, but we, we're trying to get some of them out of the hemisphere, doing a little bit more. Uh, I would also say that uh, trade isn't the only way to promote faster growth, and maybe I'll just end on a couple of these points. Back in 2012, we had an interesting meeting. We brought in our CEOs, invited counterparts from Canada and Mexico to come to Washington, and the conversation was about how the three countries could work more effectively together, and kind of building, linking on the NAFTA conversation, but three areas that were of specific interest in that uh, day-long meeting, further action in greater regulatory cooperation, which I've already mentioned, easing a legitimate movement of people, goods, and services. Now, that certainly is that's immigration reform is part of that, but also, um, again, some of the, the barriers that we find at the border on, in goods and services. Then, uh, finally, one that is happening, I would say, almost despite government, and that's realizing the potential for North American energy self-reliance. As a region, we really are now uh, a net energy exporter. We have that potential, and we've, so we've really achieved that. We are, I think it's safe to say, energy independent, but we ought to continue to enact policies that encourage full speed ahead development uh, simply because the opportunities are too great to ignore. Uh, Semper Energy, based in San Diego, again, in one of our member companies, they employ about 35,000 people in the Americas. But they've got something that's interesting. You, you know, they're a San Diego energy company. You think, well, are they international? Yeah. Their international branch and subsidiaries develop, build, and operate energy infrastructure assets so they distribute natural gas and electricity in Mexico, Chile, and Peru. No surprise there, those are TPP countries. Those are early countries that were involved in negotiating trade agreements with the U.S. So what follows from um, these agreements and the, uh, I think the reinforcing of the rule of law is opportunity. And for Semper Energy and headquartered in San Diego, California, uh, a lot of jobs right there because of what they're now doing internationally. We think also affordable, accessible energy is a critical foundation for a strong manufacturing base in the United States. And we're seeing some reshoring jobs coming back to the U.S. And again, those are jobs, again, when you look at the wage structure, often well above average wage. Um, a prosperous United States can be a leader in global growth and we can help lift economies around the world. And that's, again, something that uh, not to be underestimated in terms of our importance as, a, as, a, as an economy that still is uh, the world's most important economy 
if we had a three and a half percent growth rate rather than that two two and a half percent where we've been sort of stuck uh, a lot of good things happen one thing happens that's good for the budget a one percent increase in GDP is about uh, three trillion dollars over a ten year period of revenues coming into the Treasury that helps you start to get serious about dealing with that long-term debt it makes your whole budget process a lot easier to kind of think through and work through so I think we have lots of reasons to be optimistic I think I we the roundtable CEO certainly think the nation has to remain an optimistic forward-looking nation we've got to recognize and seize opportunities where their their trade is one of those big ones we need to fix the tax system for sure education regulatory broken immigration system, all those that I've kind of mentioned, but that requires cooperation, working together. We're delighted to be part of the solution, and I certainly thank uh, you for the invitation to join you today, and I think that the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute also can be a key part of that uh, solution. You represent a constituency and a community across the United States of growing in importance and political clout, and uh, if we can help harness that and put that to work for the good of the nation, um, that'll benefit not just the Hispanic community, but benefit every uh, citizen of the United States. So I'm, I'm delighted to, to have this opportunity to be here, and I don't know if we could go and take a question or two, but I, I will do that. But thank you very much. So, Senator, thank you.